Hello everyone. Um, so this video is going to be climbing the ladder, getting to the top of the leaderboard for image recognition competitions. And in it, we're just going to go through some of the tools and tricks and best practices that you can use to really boost your game and slowly climb the leaderboard towards the top scores in image rec recognition competitions like the invertebrates challenge that recently closed like the pothole detection or zebra versus elephant classification ones that ran a while back, and like the masks versus no masks hackathon that just wrapped up last weekend. So before we start adding on and talking about all these extra techniques, uh, let's first take a quick look at our baseline, our sort of starting point for all of this work. So in the notebook, we create a sort of basic model. It's based on a pre-trained ResNet which means that it's taking advantage of something called transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning is where you train a network on a large data set. So in this case, it's been trained on something called the ImageNet data set. And what that does is it teaches the network all these important things for classifying images, but it's not particularly related to our specific task. So you take that pre-trained network and then you retrain it, but you already kind of have this head start because it's already learned concepts like edges and corners and concepts like cats and dogs. So you can kind of repurpose those pieces to build your new classifier. So transfer learning is sort of a must in these cases where you don't have much new training data and you wanna make the best use of it that you possibly can. Um, then a couple of other things that our baseline model has that are really good to include, um, a little bit of data augmentation. So instead of just showing the exact same image multiple times to the network, each time you feed it in, you tweak it somewhat. So this can be changing the perspective a little bit, changing the lighting, uh, maybe flipping the image horizontally. And these are just ways that we build up more robust models because instead of seeing the exact same pixels, they're seeing slightly different versions of each training image. And this helps, especially when you have very little data. So transfer learning, data augmentation, and then finally, uh, using some sort of learning rate scheduler and a few of the other tricks that have kind of moved into mainstream over the past few years. So historically, what you would do is maybe pick a learning rate, you would train at that learning rate, you'd guess how many epochs to train for, or you'd train until you reach some sort of convergence. Um, but these days, there's all sorts of advances like exponential learning rates or cyclic learning rates. Um, but so long as you're using something that's a little bit more intelligent about how it trains a network, um, this can really cut down on your training time and also get you decent results. So that's the sort of baseline that we're starting from, right? And this is pretty easily achievable, whichever library you, you choose and which you, you're used to. Um, this is the defaults in something like FastAI. It's very easy with PyTorch and TensorFlow to build up a model that has a pre-trained uh, neural network that's already been trained on something large like ImageNet, and then retrain that for your classification task um, and use all these sort of clever tricks like fancy learning rate schedulers and data augmentation. So that's the baseline that we start from. Um, and you'll see we do that kind of baseline for this pothole detection challenge, which is our sort of example to demonstrate the techniques we will talk about today. And that gets a decent score. I think the score is something like 0.8, um, which is not bad, but not great. You'll see it's quite far from the top of the leaderboard. So now let's dig into all the techniques that we have at our disposal to boost that score. Okay, so first up, um, there's some obvious sliders that you can tweak, right? And what I mean by this is that these are, these are the kind of, you don't have to think about it much, almost certainly going to give an advantage buttons that you can push to get a better model, right? You can use a, a larger model, a fancier, latest, greatest architecture. You could use um, longer training times. So if you're only training for a couple of epochs, train it for a few more. Um, in most cases, that might eke out a little bit of extra performance. And you could try larger images as your inputs. So if you're only feeding in small images, um, upping the scale uh, means everything takes longer, but you might get a bit of performance there. So these three things kind of give you uh, an easy boost, but they take a lot more time when you're training. And so what I like to advocate is, yes, you can do those things if you need, but leave them for the end, right? And let's focus on some of the other ways that we can um, get, get an advantage first, because testing them is easier at the smaller scale and with a simpler network. So those are by all means sort of the, the obvious ones that everyone talks about, use a better network, train for longer. We can leave those to the end. Um, okay, the next technique is something called progressive resizing. Uh, this has gained popularity after I think it was first introduced in the fast AI video lectures and as something that was used to get a very good score on a Planet Labs satellite imagery classification task. 
Um, and the idea basically is to first train your network on fairly small input images. And the idea is, you know, it starts to learn some features from those, and then you retrain it on progressively larger and larger images. So you might start with maybe 50 pixels or 64 pixels, then double it and then double it again. Um, and that cuts down your overall training time because you're not trying to train on large images from the start. You can build up some of your classifier early and then just refine and refine. Um, so that cuts down overall training time and often adds a bit of extra robustness to the model and a bit more accuracy. So that's a great technique. Uh, right, the next one is something that um, quite a few people don't know about. I myself only found out about it recently and it's one of those head-banging moments when you do find out about it because the idea is, is really simple and super powerful. Um, so this is something called test time augmentation, right, TTA. And the idea is that you take, instead of just feeding a test image through your network to get the predictions, you take that test image and you apply the same kinds of augmentations that you applied to your training data um, so you get essentially say eight different versions of your test image. You feed each of those through the network and then you average the predictions or you combine the predictions somehow. Um, and what this means is that you get um, a slightly better prediction because maybe it sees the image and the image flipped uh, and a skewed version and a bright version and a dark version. Um, and this just helps sort of iron out any anomalies that might um, slip in. And so you generally get a much better score. And in the notebook that I shared, we do this. It's as simple as changing a single function name, right? Instead of using get preds, we're using .tta. And that's going to run fast AI's test time augmentation with all the defaults. Um, but that's going to give us a score boost from 0.8 to 0.64, where lower is better. Um, so that's a really great little trick. It takes more time to make your predictions, um, but super worth it. And it's one of those that you can just add on at the end um, for a big win. So a very, very nice technique. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is much more interesting to me because this is where you move away from generic techniques that are always useful to dataset specific tweaks that you can make, right? So this is just having a look at the actual data and interrogating how can I transform this to make it more interesting to the network. So for example, if you consider the invertebrates challenge, there's um, generally these small little creatures in the middle of a large image with lots of gray background. Right, so if you could crop out the unnecessary background and focus on the creature, then that's a really beneficial thing. And you can do that before you even feed it to your network. Um, so the example we give here is similar. It's from the potholes challenge, where all the images are from a dashboard camera, right? So the bottom third of the image is the car's dashboard, which doesn't change, or there's a few different cars, but that's not useful information to us, really. And the top third of the image is sky, where there's almost never potholes. Um, so what we're really interested in is this little band of road right in the middle. And so it's fairly trivial to add a transform that'll zoom in on that band of road and then use that as the input, right? So we've got a little example um, building that in with FastAI's um, data loaders, but you could also do that before you even look at a neural network, right? Before you do anything with the images, you could crop them and scale them however you want it before you even start training. So that's really... Um, it's a library agnostic technique, and it's worth thinking about in any given challenge, what data can I throw away? What's gonna be most useful to the model? And that can really help your scores. This little tweak was what got me up there on the potholes leaderboard. I didn't do any of the other fancy tricks we're talking about. All I did was apply this zooming in on the road and then training a very simple model, essentially following the starter notebook with larger image size. Um, so that's a really powerful technique depending on the competition. Okay, the next um, and semi-final technique that we're going to talk about is probably the most common um, trick that we see from the winners for getting that extra edge. And this is something called model ensembles, right? Very simple idea, but you take multiple different models and you average their predictions or you combine their predictions somehow. And uh, that sounds simple, but what it does is let you avoid any like one model might make a mistake on one image, um, but if you've got several models, they might all have different um, Achilles heels, they might have different advantages. So by taking the combination of their predictions, you can sort of iron out those um, mislabeled images, etc., and that gives a real boost to your accuracy. Right, so this is a cool technique. Um, it is useful and you can, you can um, go far with it. 
there's some there's some tricks so making sure that your models are diverse helps because taking the average of two identical models is just going to give you the same sort of prediction whereas um, using different model architectures or different training data different augmentations means that you get a more diverse set of predictions and the average is actually a stronger predictor um, what i don't like about model ensembles is that they start to take us back in this direction where the people who have more access to compute kind of have a competitive advantage right so if you had unlimited gpu access you could just train 20 different models use all the architectures a variety of image sizes um, combine the predictions intelligently you know using some validation um, tricks to choose which models to pay attention to and you could get a really good score um, but that's not really something that's available to most of us who are working from our laptops using google collab or kaggle kernels just trying to get um, the best entry that we can so if you are going to go that route um, please be mindful that not everyone has the compute that you do and i really encourage you as much as you can try and make your entries um, smart models as opposed to just throwing lots of models at the problem right um, just have a little bit of consideration for the rest of us uh, that said i can't really enforce that and you'll see that most um, winning entries do end up being ensembles uh, in the document i share an example from the recent invertebrates challenge a really cool group of models using resnet 50 resnet 152 at a couple of different sizes combining those with a couple of efficient nets um, and just taking a, a an average of all of those model outputs and that did really, really well. Um, but the key thing there was I think the winner um, using just a single model was quite close to the top, if not the top already. So it wasn't that they just used that as their only advantage. It was that they used this ensembling technique to get a few extra improvements on the score, but it wasn't the only part of their solution that was good. Um, so just wanted to call that out. Okay, and then finally, the last thing I want to mention is that um, aside from the techniques we've covered here, there's lots of new ones coming out all the time. And it can be a little bit overwhelming trying to keep track of what's happening and what you should be using. Uh, so the, the sort of hint that I wanted to give is that, uh, yes, there's lots of research coming out all the time. You don't necessarily have to keep track of it all. If you keep an eye on it, check up occasionally what people are using, read winners' blogs and see what people are using for real-world applications, uh, then you'll start to see some themes cropping up. And we saw this with um, like progressive resizing, right? The first time you hear about it, you can ignore it. But then you see three different competitions, the winners talked about progressive resizing, and you see a couple of cool papers coming out about it, a few sort of major people in the community tweeting with, hey, this is really cool technique. Then that's a hint that, okay, maybe that's something I should investigate and maybe incorporate into my solution. Um, but don't feel that you have to keep track of everything, mix up and self-supervised learning and, you know, all these different augmentations with all these fancy catchword names. They're all cool and you're welcome to, to play with them, but yeah, don't feel the need to frantically chase the, the state of the art. Um, cool. That's my bag of tricks. Uh, we will have office hours over this weekend. And what I'm really hoping is that um, some of you will come and say, hey, you missed X, Y, and Z. Um, please do bring those ideas to the table. This whole Zindu Weekends is about learning from each other, practicing our skills and getting better and helping each other to do the best that we can. So if you've got ideas or you've got questions, come along. I think it's going to be two o'clock on Saturday, two o'clock on Sunday. Um, come and share your results of any experiments that you've done. Chime in with what worked and what didn't on the potholes or the masks. Um, and yeah, do let us know if there's anything that we missed in this video. Good luck, everybody, and I'll see you there.